It's saved by Coton. Astonishing stop by the Manchester City goalkeeper. <laughs> okay, welcome to another Far Post header video interview. This time I've got Tony Coton with me, the former Birmingham, Watford, Manchester City and Sunderland goalkeeper. Hello, Tony. How are you, Chris? All right, fine, thank you. And how are you at the moment? Is everything okay? I'm good, thank you. Yeah, all good. Yeah, um, not too bad. Weather's not too bad up here in the uh, the northwest. No, it's good down here in the southeast as well. I'm just down in Surrey. Um, it's just about today's about your playing career and also your coaching and scouting as well. Um, as a young boy, I always wanted to be uh, the one that was scoring the goals. What made you want to? Uh, be the one in in the go in goal. Um, I always had, I always had a passion for the position, um, uh -huh. but basically it was my dad that um, he didn't make the decision for me. He just gave me some advice because um, if I take um, the weekends, I would play twice in goals and twice out. So I play Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon. And I would split it. And then all through secondary school, I captained the school in the county mm -hmm. as a centre-back. I was a centre-back. Um, then at 14, I started playing men's football as a, as the goalkeeper. Sure. And although I was still playing for my junior team, um, I had this... Um, uh, I've got it. I've got it here somewhere. Oh, there it is. But um, it's not on the wall yet. But I have a big signed shirt of Pat Jennings. So oh, I nice. had this. I was drawn towards Pat Jennings as a kid, as a sure. child. So once I started playing, I had this um, ability in goals. Um, but I was also decent out outfield. Uh, hence, playing for the school as and captain of the school and the county as a centre-back. Yep. Um, but it was my dad, just going back to your original question, it was my dad who said, listen, if you're serious about being a professional, I would stick to being a goalkeeper. I think you're better as a goalkeeper than an outfield player. But the main reason is I don't think you're fast enough. Um, okay. You know, I don't think you're a fast enough runner to, um, to make it. Um, and then I sat back and I concentrated on just being a goalkeeper then. So um so that's that was how that decision was um concluded really. It was it was my dad giving me that advice, me sitting back and um yeah, realising as a as a teenager that he, he was probably right and was proven right. Yeah, definitely. I mean coming a Football League goalkeeper and then in the Premier League as well. So it would show that yeah. your father was right on that one. Yeah. Um, you, the, the first Football League club you joined was uh, Birmingham City. What was it like to join them as they were a local club to you at the time? Yeah, so Birmingham was, although I had this affinity with Pat Jennings and Tottenham was my sort of adopted club, really, because mm. of Pat Jennings. There's no other reason I supported Tottenham other than Pat Jennings. Um, but Truth be known, I was a I was a Birmingham City fan, uh, still am, um, sure. and it, it it was it it was really the way it, it it fell into my lap. Really, was the fact that at my mum and dad's house, behind the the garden there and the railings was a football pitch, and then further up was the cemetery. Mm -hmm. Well, in the left-hand corner behind the railings there was was the mom and dad's house of a fella called Steve Fox. Uh, Steve Fox was a few years older than me. God rest his soul, he's not with us anymore. Um, but so Steve Fox um, went to the schools I did. I followed his his route. Sure. So I I, I followed everywhere he went. I'm on a Zoom call. I'm on a Zoom. Um, it's all right. The daughter's coming. <laughs> Um, so, um, my, I followed his path, um, uh, school, junior clubs, 
this happened the other. And then when I went on the terraces at St Andrews, mm. he was playing in the first team. I just thought, oh, what, a, what a feeling that must be. Yeah. To, to you know, to be playing at Birmingham City at it, blah blah blah. Um, and I just, you know, I, I I just followed his path. I got lucky um, that I got asked for a trial to go down there. I was playing for a team called My Light Rovers mm -hmm. and the manager, Roger Powers, turned around and, and said, listen, um, I know Jim Smith really well and they're looking for a young goalkeeper. Do you want to go down for a trial? I went down for a trial um, and um, uh, I had a week. I played in a game at Northampton. We won 2-0. Uh, that week became a month. They extended it a month. Then they signed me to the end of the season. Then I got a full season. Then I got released. Then I got re-signed. Uh, and then um, I got in the team. So it was a bit of a whirlwind at Birmingham. It sounds like it. And for a phrase for a whirlwind, I guess, would be that the one to, word that could describe your debut uh, against Sunderland when you had a penalty to face after less than a minute. What happened there? So um, the... the <laughs> I still say the highlight of the day wasn't the penalty save because, and I'll get to that in a minute, but my, um, we, we played two games over Christmas. So sure. December 1980, we played uh, away at Leeds and then mm -hmm. the next day we were playing home. It's just the way the fixtures felt. So we played on the on the 26th Boxing Day as, no, as normal games. And then on the 27th, we, we were at home to Sunderland. And in the game at Leeds, um, which I had travelled with the with the team uh, to Leeds, mm. um, and Jeff Whelan's the goalie had got a bit of a knee knock, um, was but was expected to be okay for the next day. Sure. Um, and then um, I was told to report to the St John's Hotel in Solihull for pre-match meal, um, which I which I did do, um, and. Um, I um, ordered a, um, a fillet steak. Now, I'm off a council estate in Tamworth and fillet steaks were just dreamt of. No, nobody knew what a fillet steak was. So um, I ordered this fillet steak. It came. I'm looking round. I'm looking. And Frank Worthington and Archie Gamble says, what are, you, what are you looking for? And I went, is there no chips? I was just <laughs> so naive. Yeah, and they just they just laughed and this that and the other. Anyway, I had this fillet steak, and twenty past two, I'm stood in the tunnel for a three o'clock kickoff. I'm stood in by the changing rooms, and there's a lot of to and fro in the manager, the assistant manager, the physios in, and blah blah blah. And then all of a sudden, just before half past two, Jim Smith says, "What are you stood there for? Get your thing kit on, <laughs> you know." And blah blah blah. And I, I, no, my dad did, and brother-in-law had come to the game. Yeah. Um, and they'd gone into what was called the D club, which is like a social club. Mm. Um, and you literally walked up the tunnel and the door into the D club from this side. You could open the door and um, and um, walk in. So I'm walking on the tunnel in my kit uh, at sort of, just after 10 to 3, to, mm. to walk up to, to go out. And as I walk up, there stood at the there stood at the, at the bar, but the door's open because the, the lady who served behind the bar liked to wish all the players good luck as they walked past. Sure. And, I, and as I've walked past, they've looked out the door and they're like <laughs> that. And they said they scrambled up to get up to the seat, like, you know, because nobody knew. Sure. And... Uh, and then uh, the game kicks off, and within 54 seconds, I hadn't even touched the ball, 54 seconds, uh, Joe Gallagher handballed, uh, and uh, they got a penalty, and I, luckily enough, saved it. Um, and, um, yeah, it went in the Guinness Book of Records, still in the Guinness Book of Records now. Wow. So uh, that was my introduction to, to league football. And that must have put you in the, the good books for the... Birmingham City fans, certainly. Well, um, yeah, there was there was um, 
the other night, Birmingham played Sunderland. Um, and um, was it Friday night? Was it Friday? Might have been Friday night. I think it was, yeah. Yeah. And um, I put on Facebook 42 years nearly, nearly to the day because it was December and we're in November. Sure. Um, um, my life changed for the better. Uh, and then loads of replies come in. I was there. I was behind the right. I was behind your goal. You know, and all all these things come in. And so, yeah. So it was a bit of a whirlwind introduction. And all that all I said when I went into the bar after, um, my dad and my brother in law were like ecstatic. Sure. And um, all I went, all I said to him was, "I've had a fillet steak." <laughs> <laughs> So I kept talking about the Philip State and they're going, what, talk about the feeling, what was it like? How did you know? What blah blah blah. Brilliant. So yeah, so that's um, that was my introduction. Must have been a good steak if it was that memorable. <laughs> I, just, um, I just remember, I just remember, can you imagine being told that you're making your debut, rushing it sort of rushing around, and then all I remember is this steak sort of sitting oh. just in there feeling like a house brick. <laughs> Good so. job you weren't playing as a centre back then. Exactly, yeah. Um, so you mentioned Jim Smith there. He must have been a good manager to have played under at the time. Well, he was, listen, Jim was a character, a real character. He was, um, you know, he, he could blaspheme with, with the best of them and call you everything under the sun. And the next day, he completely forgot what he'd said to you. You know what I mean? He was, yeah. uh, he, he was like that, but he could be so really encouraging, you know? So, um, you know, another one that's, that's passed away. Quite a few of my managers have passed away now. Mm. Um, that, um, you know, somebody who's given you your debut signs you from non-league. Sure. Um, you, you've got to, you know, you've got to be grateful for, for it. And, um, you know, it, it, football was completely different them days than what it is today. So you ne you never had no analysts. The pitches were terrible. The training ground were terrible. Um, you know, even even your training balls were, you know, they were brand new spanking balls that you get every changed yeah. every two weeks like you do now. Like you know what I mean? Sure. You got a bag of balls and that saw you through for the season. <laughs> it was um, so. So when people and young players that you look at today and you go, uh, uh, you know, you, I had it from my parents and and my grandfathers, you know, well, we had to do this and we had to do that. And you, you looked at them and you go, really? Really? And they knew best. And you go, no, they don't. It's only the same conversations that you have with your children, if, you know, and this, that and the other. Our facilities were rubbish. I mean, I've never, in all my playing career, um, I never, until I went to Man United at 35, mm -hmm. never had a gym. Really? It's... <laughs> never had a gym. No weights, nothing. Wow. And you can't <laughs> believe that, can you? No, considering like, well, you know, the, yeah, the, now it's just second nature for a team to be in using never, a gym. Never, never had it. Never had a gym. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, you know, so going back to Jim, it was just, um, you know, he was in there. He joined in training every day, you know, and this, that, and the other. And he was just a, just a lovely character. Good to hear. And um, speaking of other uh, sort of lovely characters, so I've heard uh, Graham Taylor. He came in to sign you from uh from Birmingham from to Birmingham. join down at Watford uh I understand that you had a lot of troubles in Birmingham first before having to <laughs> then move down to Watford what uh, do you mean Chris what do you mean it's on the internet um, is it fair to say yeah, that yeah, Graham yeah. Taylor saved you from these sort of Gail. issues escalating Gail. in Birmingham yeah I would I would, I would have thought so um just quickly it, it, it was the way the move come around, 
was uh, I just got called into Ron Saunders' office. He said, we've had an offer from Watford. You're free to go and speak to them. Uh, on the way down, I stopped off at Toddington Services and rang my dad, didn't know mobile phones then. Sure. I said, uh, I'm at Toddington Services. Watford had come in for me. Um, and he said, right. I says, I'm not sure because Birmingham's my team. I've only played 100 and odd games. I want to play more games. He said, um, I said, I'll ring you after um, after everything. And he says, don't ring me if you don't sign. Okay. And I said, well, he went, you need to get away from this environment and that is going to do you the world of good. You've got a disciplined manager. I had a disciplined manager in Ron Saunders um, at the time. Um, but I went, I met Graham. Um, I had a court case hanging over my head. Um, and um, he said, look, I've done all my background checks on you. You're easily led. I'm getting you away from that environment. Uh, and that was it. And I'm, I don't think I've ever had any trouble mm -hmm. since 1982, 83. No, it had been 80. I signed 84. So 83 would have been my last. So I signed 84 um, with a court case hanging over my head. He came to court. He did a character reference. And even my sister went, God, I didn't know who he was talking about. <laughs> uh, and, um, yeah, so he did. He saved me, um, took me into that environment. It was a family club, small club. Everybody knew each other. Everybody did everything for each other. Mm. If the charity lady, Anne Swanson, wanted two players for a push the pennies over or go to a children's home or the hospital. It was done. They didn't even, it was, you know, it was just, it was just done. It was, you know, that's, that's the, that's the um, culture that he brought to that club. He was, yeah, he was well renowned for that. And that was around that sort of time, the Watford uh, club were, they were known as a family club and they had such players as, um, on, on the pitch, they had, you know, uh, Luther Blissett, who'd just come back from AC Milan, uh, John Barnes, who was started to make a name for himself. It must have been an exciting time to play there. It was um, it was my debut, um, finished 5-4. Yeah. Not what, not what the fans would want from a new goalkeeper, record signing, um, letting five in. Uh, Neville Southall was at the other end as we played Everton, the great Everton team of the eighties, sure. who had who had just beaten Watford in that year's FA Cup final. Okay. So they beat Watford two 0 in the nineteen eighty four Cup final. And I joined in the September, um, and my debut is against uh, Everton. It finishes five four. I still say to this day I couldn't get any of the goals. Mm. Uh, and joint man of the matches was me and Neville Sattel. Can you believe that? 5 4. And we still get joint man of the match. So it could have been 15 all. Um, yeah. Because the exciting days of having Callahan on one wing, Barnes on the other, Mo Johnson, George Riley down the middle. Um, and Graham Taylor on signing me said, Look, we are very, very attacking, attractive side going forward. We'll score lots of goals. We just need to stop them going in. Um, and I let five in on my debut. Um, so it wasn't um, it wasn't on the menu that. Um, no. Anyway, the next game um, I played at um, away at Cardiff, and we should have got beat, but I played really well. And um, Graham just pulled me to one side and he said, "That's why I've signed you." Um, and then it, it just went from there. And we were, um, as a goalkeeper, at Birmingham, I played with some really good lads, some good friends. Um, mm. We were one or two players short. What we didn't do, we didn't give many goals away at Birmingham, but we didn't score enough. At Watford, we'd always score. You could guarantee it was never hardly ever a nil, nil, <laughs> nil or anything like that. It's hardly any times that I can remember where we didn't score. Um, and that was because mainly because of the philosophy that Graham had instilled in the team. 
And we had two of the best wingers at that time the con country had seen in Callahan mm -hmm. and Barnes. Um, so it was very exciting times to go and watch Watford. Must yeah. have been good for the season ticket holders then. Yeah, it was. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, for me, going out, going onto onto the pitch, even if you conceded early or whatever, mm -hmm. I always felt if we don't concede again, we're we'll, we're always in the game. Brilliant. It's a bit like Keegan's Newcastle. Then it's sort of you score three, we'll score four, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And so there was one performance that I've read about that lots of Watford fans still remember you for is a goalless draw at Anfield in the 86 yeah. FA Cup run. Um, yeah, what were your a, memories of that? There's um, a shield up there that I got awarded for that performance. Oh, wow. Um, um, yeah, it was one of them that, uh, for some strange reason, I don't know how it happened, but we, we seemed to play on a Wednesday night. I think it was a Tuesday or a Wednesday night at sure. Anfield in the um, in the quarterfinal. Um, I don't know why that happened, whether it was... I don't know why, why, but anyway, we did. And it was everything on my side. The gods, every, every, everybody was with me that day. Um, and I made, I don't know how many saves, umpteen saves. Um, I got luck. Um, I played the best I'd ever played. Uh, everything fell for me, you know. If uh, you know, if if there was a couple of deflections, which I remember even to this day, normally shoot whiz past you, wrong foot, your everything. They they went in in my favour, um, and it was it was literally a standing ovation from everybody, mm. and all the Liverpool players clapping me off as well. Wow! So. so that yeah, so it, it was, um, yeah, it was a magical uh, game, that one. Especially, I'd imagine, half, like the first or second half, whichever end, was having the cop behind you as well. That must have been sort of special to be making uh, those sort of saves in front of them. No, the cop, the cop was the first half. Sure. And then I, I was up the, I don't, um, I don't know what it's called, that end, that, the other end. Anfield um, Road end? Yeah, where the Watford fans were. Sure. Yeah, so. Yeah, so it was, um, yeah, that was probably one of my better performances of um, my career, if Brilliant. not the best, <laughs> because um, of the fans' invasion. Um, I remember some Tottenham fans running up to me, uh, and I thought, hey, here we go. Uh, and they were just dubious, and I just, I just said to them, look, You've won the game. Get off the pitch. Don't get yourself arrested for something stupid or yeah. words to that effect. Um, and that was that. Um, and everybody says, "Oh, you 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 seem to be really calm." I said, "Well, I said I had a proper pitch invasion when I played for Birmingham West Ham in the cup as well. We, we were three nil up. We were three nil up with I don't know a few minutes to go, and West Ham invaded the pitch at St Andrews." Uh, and I mean, horses on, you know, fans fighting in, uh, you know, in me in me penalty area and stuff like that. Um, so I was, I was probably experienced pitch invasions, really. <laughs> so, yeah. So that was that was the um, that was the the two cup games. One we won and one we lost. Ah. Uh. Yes, well, Arsenal, my team, actually went on and won the cup that season. I remember, so that was one of that was the first season I started watching, or rem remembering watching Arsenal. So yeah. it was just a standout one because it was live on the telly as well. And I just remember you. I remember them focusing on you, and I, I can't remember what they said now, but it was just something when I was researching your career, and I could remember that game. Yeah. That was a standout moment. Um, yeah. Moving, you were at City for a while, and then couple of goalkeepers came in, Ika Immel and Andy Dibble was around then. And you so you, you made the move uh to across the city to Manchester United uh early nineteen ninety six. They were this was the famous team that uh Alan Hansen said you'd never win anything with kids. And they promptly went out and won the League and Cup double. What was it like training with those uh players the best? It was, all, it was also the um the season, Chris, of the Kevin Keegan rant. 
Yes. 12, 12 points clear. Uh, I'll love it. I'll love it if we beat them. <laughs> um, so that was that season as well. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, when it came about, you know, it was, I'd been in, I got injured the previous season and I'd had a real serious leg injury. Mm. Uh, in that summer, I was getting myself fit. Alan Ball had come in as manager. Mm-hmm. He didn't know me. He hadn't seen me. Obviously, he'd seen me play. Um, and then, um, you know, one thing led to another. Uh, and then I got a phone call. There's a, I don't know whether you know Manchester at all, but there's a, there's a big bridge on the outskirts of Manchester near the Trafford Centre called Barton Bridge. Okay. Uh, which goes over the Manchester Ship Canal. Uh, and I was literally going over there when the phone call came in that Man City had um, accepted a bid from Man United and I was free to go and speak to um, um, the chairman, Martin Edwards. Mm. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, I've got to get home, get changed and look smart. Mm. Um, but all, all, all that was going through my mind was, the squad of Man United. I'm thinking, I've got to go and see what the, what's so special at this this place, you know. And I went, um, and they were great players. They were great players. The training wasn't spectacularly different to anywhere. It's much of a muchness, really. The tra- really? Training. You, you good coaches, you bad coaches, but the training, in essence, the um your type of training is it was similar to where anywhere I'd been. Mm. Um it was just that they had really good players, really good players. Um and they had a confidence about them. Um and consequently they um they clawed it back and um beat Liverpool in the final one 0 with Canton R scoring the winner. Yes, that cup. Were you, were you at the cup final for that? Were you the substitute goalkeeper that day, or were you? No, because it was only one sub them days. Ah, oh, right. Okay. It wasn't like it was today, so it was only one sub. Um, mm. But I'd been out, done the warm up with Peter Smichael, and then um, and then put my tracksuit on and sat on the bench. Sure. What was Schmeichel like then? Because he was obviously now his son's playing, but I'd... Schmeichel. Senior was he was one of the best goalkeepers I think that there's been of his generation. He was fantastic. What what can you remember of playing alongside him? As uh, Peter's um, Peter's was a natural goalkeeper. He didn't need a lot of training. He liked to play out a lot mm-hmm. in training. Um, biggest thing was Peter was his size, but he was so quick on his feet. He really quick for a for a big guy. Um so um yeah, so Peter, um good guy, we got on together. Um and when I signed Sir Alex had, had tried to convince me and said, Listen, Peter's missing training, there's no one to push him, I need somebody to push him. Sure. I, I went in and he never missed a day's training and he was absolutely brilliant. <laughs> Absolutely brilliant for the end of the season. Uh, yeah. He was probably the main reason. Him and Eric Cantona were probably the main reason that they they won the double. Two very good players and Premier League legends, I suppose. Yeah. Too. And, uh, yeah. and that's a phrase that's used a lot these days, quite loosely, the phrase legends. But yeah, I would go so to too easily, if I, if, if I may say so. Definitely. But the end of that season, you then left and joined Sunderland. Uh, who were playing it the last few days at Roker Park. Um, but your career was ended whilst at Sunderland. You broke your leg in five places, I hear, against uh, Southampton. I've never been back to them places either. No? Um, yeah. Uh, away at Southampton, inoculus challenge from Egglost instead. Mm-hmm. Uh, I knew straight away I'd broke my leg. Um even in the ambulance, they said, no, it'd be bad bruising. I said, no, I broke my leg, broke my leg. Um, um, and then uh, in the hospital, mm. even the uh, nurse that took me in for my x-ray said, it's bad bruising. I said, look, they've told me in the ambulance, they told me on the pitch, it's bad bruising. I said, I've broke my leg. Trust me, I've broke my leg. 
Right. Um, and then uh, she said sheepishly as she read the X-ray results out, um, oh, there is a break. Oh, there is a, there's a second break there, Mr. K there's a third one. And then after she said the third one, she didn't even mention the fourth and fifth. She just turned to the kit man who'd come with me and, and went and put Jeez. five fingers, well, four fingers and a thumb up. Yeah. And, uh, and that was it. So um, I knew then that I was too old to get back after that. They told me it was going to be a year out, mm. you know, so I, it just it didn't work out. And now your career come to an end. You went back to Old Trafford and started as a coach. Uh, well, I went to Sunderland as player coach. Uh, okay, so I <laughs> Yeah, so I went there as player goalie coach and then I ended up taking the reserves. Okay. Um, and my first full season, uh, we won the league, won the Pontins League. Brilliant. Uh, and I thought, oh, this will, this will do for me. Um, I fancy this, being coach, manager. Really enjoyed it, taking the team, organising it and planning it. Um, and I thought, right... Um, this is this is the route I'll go down, um, and then um, I saw Sir Alex. Man United came to Roper Park. I was in the tunnel. Saw Sir Alex and Brian Kidd. What's your plans? Uh, blah blah blah. You ever thought of being full time goalkeeping coach with us? I've never had one. Come and see me next time you're in Manchester. And um, I made an excuse and said I was down there the next week. <laughs> uh, went in to see him and that's how it started and you know and I was there what 10 years and, and it was um, just silverware 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 all every year basically Absolutely. and what was he like to work for Sir Alex fantastic absolutely fantastic he was um, uh, he's not what everybody perceives He's he's got a uh, good sense of humour, fun side of to him. Uh, obviously, we know he's he's strict and all this. Um, and the only way I can say it was, you knew you were going, you you knew you were doing a good job because he never never come and questioned you with anything. Sure. Um, and that was sort of quickly recognised that uh, if he doesn't come and say anything or ask you what's it, then you're doing a good job. Uh, and then at, at the end of every season, um, he would come around the staff individually and, and praise them for their work, and then cheer them up for the next um, the next um, season. And that 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 that's, must be just sort of feel so good knowing that somebody that powerful, sort of as a that great a person at their job, was coming around speaking to each of the staff, saying thank you. Must have yeah. given people that extra sort of. Oh, it was just you know, all, all around the training ground. Sure. It was, um, he knew everybody, everybody's first name. He knew their partners' names, husbands, wives, uh, kids' names, uh, and he would stop and talk to everyone. And he, he made it a real, you know, marvellous place to go and work. The environment right. was great. And that lasted for 10 years, as you said, uh, but then you had to retire after injury. Um, I read somewhere that your successor as goalkeeping coach then invited you along to the Champions League final at the end of that season. Um, and that was the start of a difficult... To... Big pun, I sorry. didn't want to go. I didn't yes. want to go, no. I was going to say that that was the start of a difficult part of your life. Yeah. Um, it was... Um, I think it was at the, that time where it had hit in... It, it, it had sort of its own, mm. and I thought to myself, um, "This is really, really hurting now because you know I'd done all, everything I'd done. How many premierships we'd won, our FA cups, and this, that, and the other." And then Richard, who's the goalkeeping coach now, still mm. I'd bought into the academy, and he stepped it and filled in for me. Was going to the Champions League final. Richard says, I want you to be my guest. And I was lost. I was totally mm. lost. Mm. I travelled with the families um, and I felt everyone was staring at me thinking, what's he doing here? And 
Yes, yeah. and I just hated every minute of it. Hated every minute of it. Mm. Um, and I thought, at one point, I thought, I'm just going to stay in the hotel. I'm not going to the game. And if I can get a flight home tonight while the game's on, I will. Yeah. I asked them, I made a few inquiries and and um, I couldn't. So I had to see it through. Um, because of the time difference in Russia, yes. Moscow, the um, the after party, um, because it went to extra time, penalties, and then mm -hmm. you got all the press stuff after. I think the after party didn't start till about 3.30 in the morning. Um, it was ridiculous time. Uh, and I'm there on my own. Mm -hmm. um, I was sat at a table on my own um, with Richard's two other guests that I didn't even know them. Uh, and it was hard work for me. I, I, I just couldn't get any enthusiasm or anything. And then... Um, they all came in. I, had, I congratulated the players, had a few beers, and then I just slipped off. Yeah. Uh, and just left them to it. Um, and, um, you know, Richard thought he was doing the right thing and fair play to him, you know. Um, but um, I didn't enjoy it at all. No. A few years after this, you then had, uh, I believe it was a quintuple heart bypass as well. Um, well, I had the, I had the, um, so what was the final? The final was about 2007 and eight, wasn't it? Against Chelsea? Yes. Yeah. So that was the, that was the time of that Champions League. Um, and then 2012 had the heart attack, two stents. And then 2018, I had the uh, quintuple bypass. Yeah. Wow, just falling yeah. apart. It seems <laughs> that's literally, yeah, literally. My body's just full of scars. Wow, yeah, a lot of Barry Sheen. <laughs> but you've, you know, you've come, you've come around. You've, you, you mentioned in your book, uh, your autobiography called "Dare to Be Shot Out," a fantastic title, I might add. Um, Do you know who come up with that title? No idea. The guy, the, the guy who wrote it with me, what do you call him? A ghostwriter, do you? Or what yes, do you call that's him? That's right, yeah. Um, Simon, who was a friend of mine. Um, and uh, it was his wife, when we were thinking of a title, she said, well, she said, um, why don't you call it There to be Shot At? Because he stands there and everyone shoots at him. Perfect. And um, I thought, well, that's a good title, There to be yeah. Shot At. So, um, yeah. So um, I think at the time she taught it a little bit different that if you made a mistake, everyone would shoot you down, you know, because you're in a goalkeeper and, and this, that, and the other. But I looked at it quite differently that I'm in goals and everybody's shooting to try and beat you. So double meanings. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah. So that's that's how that came around. Yeah. And all of the information's in there that you've told me about uh, so far. You've uh, since. The uh, the time at United and then the health problems as well. You've also been uh, helping as a players agent, and you're now scouting. You've scouted at various different clubs up north. The, and... I would probably say this, Chris, in terms of players agent. Uh, there was a close friend of mine that um, helped me when I was a, a player. He was an agent, mm. and because I'd had to pack in with money and. I couldn't coach um, this, that, and the other, and I missed that day to day. He asked me, "Would I go and work with him?" Yeah, and I said, "In what capacity?" So, I, although it, it says on Wikipedia that I've tried to change, I don't know how you change your page on Wikipedia. Yeah, somebody, I don't know who it is, um, but I've tried to change it to give the true facts, mm. and then when I next look. It's gone Come back to what it was before. So who looks at it and does it? I don't know how it does it. No, I've got no idea. So although it says a player's agent, I wasn't actually a player's agent. I didn't do any deals or contracts or anything like that. I was more just a scout for him to tell him who the best players were. Of course. Or, or good young players coming through. And that's that's what it was, really. And then I got into the scouting at clubs. Um, mm. 
the Bolton one was, I didn't even get paid by Bolton. That, that was just helping Neil Lennon out because he lived near me. Fair enough. Uh, um, he lived in the next road. And I just saw him one day and he said, could you do some scouting for me? I went, yeah. Um, and they just paid paid my expenses. I went up the training ground. Um, and that's And like I say, that's what I enjoyed the most going in and mixing with the players and um but uh, you know so he allowed me to do that mm. um but i didn't i didn't get paid from him and then um where did i go then wigan i think no did i go to dubai at some point i went to dubai and i was coach out there and... what made you want to go there no that was 2010 so i'd had the knee problem then i was doing the <laughs> the agent scouting type thing. Sure. And then I got a phone I got a phone call. I was doing um I was doing a charity thing for the homeless. Mm -hmm. Um and I got a phone call on the way there and it was a guy in Dubai saying he was representing the Crown Prince's office. Um would I be interested in going out? And I said to him, look, I'm literally um two minutes away from this charity event, which was going to be all day. Um, if you're serious, um, and it was a fax then, it was no emails then, uh, Chris, it was a fax machine. I said, fax me through an offer, uh, and by the time I get in, and then I'll read it, and I'll I'll see. Anyway, um, I rang Ellen, and I just said to her, I said, there's a fax coming. Can you rip it off and tell me what it's about? I said, because I've had this phone call. And she she just read it and she went, bump, 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 bump. She said, you've got to go. She said, you've got to go. She says, yeah. warm weather will do you do your joints. The world are good. Uh, and I've never been to Dubai. And me and the kids can come out every school holiday because it says so in the contract <laughs> that fights for family. So, uh, so she'd made my mind up before I'd even got home, really. Um so that was an experience, different culture, um, mm -hmm. and experience in that. Uh, and then I come back and then um, had the heart problem and then just went on the um, um, the scouting uh, route then, um, which I'm doing now and I thoroughly enjoy. I've been, I've been fantastic to be involved in football for this long. Being yeah. taking all I know. Yeah, exactly since the late late 70s when you started your playing career all the way through and then to the coaching and the scouting yeah. it must have been fantastic yeah. and well it's been great talking to you tony thank you very much for your time no problem chris thank you thank you thanks mate